The view from the clouds above the Indian Northeast is breathtaking, but simple. Hills give way to forests, forests to plains, and plains to cities. And somewhere in between flow mercurial rivers, meandering leisurely to their final destiny. From the sky, national boundaries are a matter of inference. Rivers originate from one part of the land mass and flow on to another, and in many cases, from one country to another. People, ideas, and culture also follow the same pattern. For thousands of years, great rivers of India and Southeast Asia, like the Ganges, Brahmaputra, Chindwin, Iravadi, and Mekong, have irrigated the land between India and Vietnam and imbued this region with a unique culture. In ancient Southeast Asia, city-states like Bagan, Angkor, Champasak, and Champa came up along the banks of these rivers and became centers of civilization. Woven together by common rice-growing culture and similar religions, Hinduism and Buddhism, they absorbed major elements of Indian culture and later indigenized it. About 500 kilometers from the Indian border, inside Myanmar lies Bagan, the first Indianized kingdom of Southeast Asia. It was also the first Buddhist civilization at an imperial scale. Strategically located between China and India, Bagan geographically presents itself as a bridge between the East and the West. The land route from Indian Northeast to Bagan was not easy. Mountains and dense forests served as a natural screen to prevent the movement of people. After years of search, the British rulers discovered a path from India that could open China's Yunnan province and Southeast Asia to them. Ravaged by time and nature, Bagan is a fascinating place. Thousands of red brick pagodas built between the 8th and the 11th century seem to grow out of this flat, parched earth. The eastern sun seems to do more here than in other places. Tourists from all over the world wait and watch patiently for that moment when the sprawl of pagodas seems to be in flames. It is magic in any language. In the 21st century, Bagan's glorious past holds promise for its future. Bagan reached a high level of cultural evolution between the 9th and the 13th century. Its riches attracted Brahmins, Buddhist monks, astrologers, artisans, and all those people who thrive under royal patronage. Bringing skills with them, they also helped in deepening two great religions of the Gangetic Plains of India, Hinduism and Buddhism. The big question is, how did religion and culture from India spread to Southeast Asia when its kingdoms never tried to conquer, colonize, or convert people? Contrary to dominant impression, Indian religions did not always follow the sea trade route to Southeast Asia. Also, Angkor and Bagan were both river civilizations far away from the sea. Evidently, History and circumstances compelled Indians to look east. Anthropologists believe that the priestly class brought Hinduism and Buddhism here, as such a complicated religion could not have been served by profit-driven but simple-minded traders. First, the Indian priests were forced to look for peace and new patrons. Fascinated by high culture and rituals of Brahminism, Southeastern Asian rulers began to seek their services. The Brahmins helped them earn divine legitimacy for their rule and also taught them the esoteric language of the Hindu scriptures, Sanskrit and Pali. At another level, around the same time, West Asian rulers barred the sale of gold to Indian traders, compelling them to look for new supply zones. An interesting mix of religious and commercial factors began to move people of different skills and abilities towards the East, known in Indian scriptures as the Swarnabhumi. 
The kings who ruled these parts were keen to construct roads that could link the east with the west. Besides trade, their major desire was to visit the land where Lord Buddha attained enlightenment. This long-held hope may get realized in the coming years with the resolve of India, Myanmar, Thailand, Lao PDR, Cambodia and Vietnam. All the countries that share a common land mass and a distinct culture to work towards building an east-west corridor. This plan to leverage old civilizational links between these countries is the cornerstone of the recently inked Mekong Ganga Cooperation Pact. The Mekong Ganga Cooperation believes that a decent road, rail and air infrastructure could help in promoting tourism and in strengthening cultural ties between members. Lowering of barriers on trade and travel with access to each other's market and facilitating cross-country movement could help in their economic development. The belief is that if free movement and free trade could work in ancient times, then it should work now. In some ways, this agreement seeks to replicate in the modern context the same free environment that allowed close religious, cultural and economic interaction between India and other ancient kingdoms of this region. Hinduism and Buddhism would not have reached their civilizational apogee if they had not been exposed to the indigenous cultures and faith of people living in Southeast Asia. Hinduism is not only a religion, it is a way of life. What made this religion so enduring was its extensive symbolism. All these years, its impress has been felt on statecraft, education, human relationship, agriculture, architecture, and also on the structure of society. Millions of temples came up in the land of believers. Some of them were made so grand so as to evoke the feeling of godliness amongst the faithful towards the structures. Temple architecture and its intricate wall carvings and paintings perfected in temple towns of India became the standard for other countries to follow. Situated on the banks of the Ganges, Varanasi epitomizes this old civilization. A human settlement for thousands of years it betrays an infectious spiritual frenzy. Hindus have been coming from far to take a dip in the holy Ganges and pray at its temples. Here, religion not only meant worship of innumerable deities, but also meant commerce and livelihood for its residents. Artists, artisans, astrologers, weavers, all prospered in an environment where culture and business were two sides of the same coin. Brahmanism alone did not find the Gangetic Plains fertile for its evolution and growth. About 2000 years ago, around 400 BC, Siddharth Gautam, a prince belonging to an upper Ganges Valley Kingdom, gave up his protected life and began his search for enlightenment. At Bodhgaya in Bihar state, Gautam sat under a tree and attained enlightenment. He founded the Buddhist religion, which was seen to oppose ritualism of the Brahmins. For the next 40 years, Gautam Buddha, as he was now known, gave his discourses in all the major towns of the Gangetic Plain, winning millions of followers. Buddha's teachings fired the imagination of a large mass of people and became a religion of compassion and reason. Buddhism had a civilizing impact over large parts of Asia and beyond. Later, Theravada Buddhism from Sri Lanka struck roots in Southeast Asia. Bodhgaya has been of special significance for Myanmar and Bagan. In the 11th century, the great Buddhist king of this ancient kingdom, Kyanzitha, is believed to have sent in a ship carrying gems of diverse kinds and lights that burn forever to Bodhgaya. The ship lost its way. Later, 
his successors repaired the sacred shrine. Right up to the 20th century, Burmese people took an active part in restoring it to its pristine glory. Kyanzitha was also the builder of the world-famous Ananda Temple in Bagan. A temple of rare beauty, Ananda stands out from thousands of other pagodas. Myths have it that eight monks from India came to Kyanzitha's court and asked for alms. A great believer, he gave them food and built a monastery for them. He also entreated them to show him the design of a temple from Bengal, which he could make in Bagan. Ananda Temple is the outcome of their vision. The standing images of a serene Buddha blessing the faithful have a hypnotic quality, and his size, an indication of the stature he enjoys in the eyes of the faithful. The influence of Gangetic civilization is not frozen in stone. It is visible in people who live around these famous shrines. Besides common agricultural practices, their dress too is similar to what is worn by people in large parts of eastern India. Women wear a sarong called tame, and men's longi is similar to the Indian lungi. But there is something still uniquely Myanmar. Women liberally apply sandal paste on their fair faces to protect themselves from the harsh rays of the sun. Bagan is also famous for its exquisite lacquerware. Skilled artisans spend hours to create designs that have a feel of Tibetan Buddhist art. Another very compelling sight of Myanmar are its innumerable tea stalls with small Lilliputian stools. People sit here for hours together, sipping their sweet brew and eating their samosas. Just a little upstream towards Bagan is Myanmar's second largest city, Mandalay. As the crow flies, it is about 500 kilometers from the Indian border. The city is a living testimony of the civilizational and commercial competition. Mandalay's geostrategic importance has increased after the world crossed over to the new millennium. From here, it is possible to pursue the great game of accessing the Andaman Sea through the Irrawaddy River. Built in 1857, by King Mindon Min, Mandalay did not really remain a free city for too long. In 1885, the British colonialists deposed its successor, King Thibaut, and sent him into exile. Mandalay then became a part of Imperial India. In the brief period that the kings ruled Mandalay, the city became a major center for art and commerce. There are streets that specialize in making fine gold leaf, Buddha statues and handloom textiles. Not far from Mandalay Hill is the famous Kothodor Pagoda. Built by King Mindon in 1859, this pagoda houses the world's largest book. 729 upright stone slabs complete with Buddhist scriptures in Pali script. Forty percent of the city's population comprises of monks and nuns. Mandalay is one of those few cities that have Buddhist nunneries. With their tonsured heads, these young and old nuns submit themselves to the Buddhist faith. They have the discretion to stay in this environment of physical self-denial for as long as they want. The Pathodogai Pagoda is synonymous with Amrapura. This Buddhist monastery imparts tenets of Theravada Buddhism to the young monks, and it is a fascinating sight when the young boys are initiated into the order. 
Most Myanmar men enter a monastery at some time in their life, where they study religious scriptures, collect arms in the morning, and lead a life of self-abnegation and piety. This practice integrates ordinary people with religion and sustains these centers of spiritual learning. Yangon, formerly Rangoon, Myanmar's capital, combines a fascinating mix of commerce, history and culture. Its skyline reflects this diversity. There are minarets of mosques, spires of Hindu temples, and tall skyscrapers of luxury hotels like traders. But what really catches the eye of the tourists and believers is the 2,500-year-old Shwedegon Pagoda. The people of the city are extremely passionate about this holy shrine that holds Lord Buddha's relics. Legend has it that two brothers brought the original sacred hair of Buddha from India across the ocean. A site was chosen where Shwedegon was constructed. In the early days, the gold-gilded pagoda was only eight meters high. Later, Myanmar's rulers raised the golden pagoda to its present height. Part of British India till 1935, Myanmar and India ended up sharing a common destiny. Many Indian freedom fighters were jailed in Myanmar. The most famous of them all was India's last Mughal emperor, Bahadur Shah Zafar. After India's first war of independence in 1857, the British colonialists sent the poet emperor Zafar to exile. Zafar spent his days pining for his country and writing poetry. In death, Zafar is treated as a saint by people of Indian descent, who pray at his mausoleum for the fulfillment of their wishes. History and the past have a way of leaving their imprint on daily lives. Besides Indian shops, the most manifest expression is the Myanmar script. Reflective of its interesting geographical location, the Myanmar script has freely borrowed from southern parts of India even if the dialect is truly their own. The same adaptation is visible in Myanmar's performing arts. Stories of Ramayan and Buddhist Jatakas are played out in ballet and through puppet shows. In Yangon, Karawik, a replica of a royal boat provides an exotic backdrop to these art forms. On the eastern border of Myanmar, not so quietly flows the great river Mekong. Emerging discreetly from the Qinghai province in China, Mekong transforms itself into a magical river that covers 4,800 kilometers and traverses through six countries of Southeast Asia. As it flows down from China's Yunnan province, it breaches the Shan Plateau and becomes first the border between Myanmar and China and later serves as a boundary between Myanmar, Thailand and Lao PDR. This is the historic Golden Triangle. In famously synonymous with the cultivation of opium, the Golden Triangle remained in the eye of the storm for a major part of the 20th century. A legacy of the colonialists who ruled these parts Opium cultivation is largely seen as the scourge of this region. All the countries that surround the Golden Triangle are trying to wean tribals living in this region away from the lure of the poppy. On one side of the Golden Triangle is the People's Democratic Republic of Lao. Known as the country of a million elephants, Lao is truly Mekong country. As the river spends the maximum time here, it was in the fitness of things that the Mekong Ganga Cooperation was signed in Vientiane, the capital of Lao PDR. The cooperation was flagged off in November 2000 and envisaged deepening relations between India and other countries of the Mekong region in the realm of tourism, transport, trade, education and culture. Lao is a hermit country. After being under French rule for many years in the early part of the 20th century, Lao was drawn into protracted war 
with the USA and its allies. In 1975, the Patet Lao movement came to power and began a socialist reconstruction of this Mekong country. But after the collapse of the Soviet Union in 1991, Lao PDR has initiated market-friendly policies and substantially improved its tourism infrastructure. Vientiane is an extremely beautiful town. It's difficult to come across a capital city anywhere in the world where rice fields jostle for space with low-rise buildings. Its unhurried pace and absence of traffic jams can delude people into believing that they're in a different era and age. Vientiane and other cities of Lao PDR are destinations for those who miss the languid pace of the 60s. In spite of war, fires and the damages that have taken place due to civil strife, Lao has zealously guarded the symbols of its national culture. That Luang is the symbol of its national pride and culture. Built in 1566, the central stupa is an inspiration from India's first Buddhist stupa at Sanchi. Legend has it that this pagoda contains the relic of Lord Buddha. In the soft morning and evening sun, the Pat Luang acquires an ethereal golden feel that leaves an indelible impression on visitors. Culturally, Lao is extremely rich and has dance forms that underline the unity with the Indian Northeast. Just about 45 minutes away by Lao aviation flight from Vientiane is the cultural capital of Lao. As the plane flies over the cloud-covered green mountains and thick forests, it's easy to sense the magic of Luang Prabang. Situated at the confluence of Mekong and Nam Khan rivers, Luang Prabang was the capital of the Lenziang Kingdom. The royalty's influence continued till 1975 until the king was sent into exile. The royal palace is now a national museum. Luang Prabang was declared a World Heritage Site by the UNESCO. The town is emerging as a robust tourist center and many visitors find the place addictive. The longer you stay, the longer you want to stay. A boat ride on the Mekong to the Pakao Caves. 24 kilometers away from the town could be an interesting experience. After negotiating treacherous waters and climbing a hundred odd steps, one wonders who thought of putting these innumerable images of Lord Buddha in such a dark corner of the world. There are hundreds of big and small statues of standing Buddha in typical Laotian style. Just opposite these caves lies a village that was mandated by the Luang Prabang kings to maintain this cave temple. In many ways, this village looks straight out of the Indian Northeast states. From Luang Prabang and Vientiane, the Mekong River flows to the south of the country through dense forests into the historically important region of Champasak. It's in this region that the Mekong Ganga cooperation with all its nuances acquires the greatest meaning. If there is one place where the two great river civilizations have their confluence or Sangam, then it is at Champasak. The capital of Champasak, Pakse, has the potential to emerge as a significant staging post for an unparalleled cultural expedition. The boat journey on the Mekong can be a stimulating experience. During monsoon, 
the river creates many islets and at places it has 10 different lanes. Sipando, or the 10,000 islands, can be the high point of the journey on the Mekong. Bane Konitai was the site of the first rail built by the French. Under the French rule, the train was meant to transport goods from Cambodia to a nearby port. After they left, the train system was also scrapped and never revived. A lone engine rusts in one part of the island. A testimony of how inter-country transport links became a casualty to paucity of funds and civil strife. Mekong Ganga Cooperation could help in reviving such projects. Bani Konithai has other treasures too. Just a little distance ahead, there is a Buddhist temple. Behind the shrine lie the remnants of an old Shiva temple, a Shivlinga. Religious revivalism, after all, is a zero-sum game. A short distance from Champasak is the Hindu kingdom of Watpu. Decrepit and in need of urgent attention, the old 10th century kingdom has been devastated by nature, invasions and relic hunters. Situated in the lower slopes of Pupusak, the Wat Pu temple was the precursor of the world's wonder Angkor Wat in Cambodia. Wat Pu has what it takes to be a major heritage site. The temple's pillars are extremely shaky, but its main edifice has managed to remain firm even in its manifest instability. The government of Lao, with its meager resources, has tried to preserve it, but it could do with more help. Wat Pu was built in seven layers. The broken stairs and unstable platforms make it difficult to reach the top. Right at the top and just behind the main temple is a water source, which gently washes the deity. Myths abound about the temple, one being that the water sprang from Lord Shiva's hair just like the Bhagirathi, and it has power to heal the ill and the suffering. Even in summer, the stream never dries up. According to old writings, there was a road link between Wat Pu and Angkor Wat, and thousands of pilgrims traveled between these two major shrines. The Lao government is keen to rebuild the old road to Angkor, so that this ancient temple could take advantage of the attention that Angkor has been receiving for some years. The manner in which the artifacts, mostly Hindu deities from Watfu, have been kept in garages and warehouses is very distressing. The search for funds to build a museum is on. If there is one place that may hugely benefit from the Mekong Ganga cooperation, and its mandate to preserve relics of our common culture, then it is at Watfu. In some ways, the Mekong Ganga cooperation underlines the tragedy of a common civilization. For 200 years, it became a casualty to mindless politics and designs of imperial powers. Wars and strife that visited India and Southeast Asia in its wake severed old links between communities and made them forget about their common heritage. Trapped by ideology and the great game of imperialists, countries of this region forgot their natural links and began to see neighbors suspiciously. As the haze and confusion of our immediate past rises, the contours of reality are beginning to unfold. And in some ways, the truth resembles the great Mekong. The more it irrigates the lands through which it passes, the bigger and greater the river becomes. Civilizations and economies are little different. <laughs>